God bless you, brothers and sisters. Welcome to another Bible study. Amen. The Lord has been good to us. We thank him for the break that we had, but we're back into Bible study, back into the book of Genesis, and we thank God for some of the simple things that we have seen so far, some of the simple surveys and reviews that we have done so far which has given us a kind of background and overview of the book of Genesis. And it is important that we grasp, it is important that we get a hold of what is outlined in the book of Genesis. Because, and we said it before, this book, Genesis, uh, outlines and contains the basic building block for everything else that is to come in the Bible. If we fail to take and appreciate and grasp the reality of the book of Genesis, then everything else in the Bible which is hinged on that book is going to be somewhat distant from us. Why do I say that? We know that the book of Genesis speaks about creation and it gives us a background uh, as to what happened and how it happened and what was somehow in the mind of God uh, to an extent that was shown to us, that was revealed. But apart from the creation, the book of Genesis also outlined to us the fall of man. And while that was outlined, it also gave to us the redemption of fallen man. And all this was outlined in that one book called Genesis, the book of beginnings. Now, if we understand that and understand that fundamentally, we were created, we were made in innocence, we were made to serve God, but then sin entered the world and the world system. And as a result of sin and the fall, we were separated from Almighty God. But in the same Genesis, we were given uh, an outline, an idea, and it was small but was very clear that God was going to provide a means by which we were going to be redeemed from the fall. And everything, every book, every message coming throughout the scriptures had or has its links right back to the book of Genesis. Because what we see in Exodus, where Moses started uh, that process of killing an animal. In fact, it was started before Moses. But what we see happening in Exodus and how it came together in a particular manner to show a particular pattern, it was essentially God giving us an idea from then of what ultimately was to come to bring about the final solution in terms of salvation. So everything after Genesis, Exodus going all the way down, all had a bearing on what transpired in Genesis. When we come down to the New Testament and we come down even into the book of Acts and the church is born and men and women are showing us, the apostolic leadership was showing us how to be saved it all had its genesis in the book of Genesis, where we fell and the plan throughout the Bible, interwoven right throughout, was to get us back into right relationship with God. When we look into the epistles, the writings of the apostles were there to guide us as to how to live and show us the way that we should follow so that we could walk in true holiness in keeping with the salvation precepts and principles so that ultimately we will make it back 
into relationship with God and make it in later on in the new Jerusalem and into all that God has in store for us in the world to come. This was made clear in the book of Revelation. So that everything, brothers and sisters, from Exodus all the way down to Revelation is putting together the pieces so that what happened in Genesis and the fall and God's showing to us his plan to redeem the world, it went through an entire process, through all the books in the Bible, and culminated in the book of Genesis where all that was lost in Genesis, in the garden, was regained in Revelation, in the new garden, in the new Jerusalem. And I want us to understand so that a lack of understanding of some of the fundamental things in Genesis will leave us baffled as we go through the different episodes, the different stories that are outlined in the other books going through the ages. So it is very important. And so I, I, I really want us to take the time out to look back over the things that we have gone through already so that we have a, a survey, a background of Genesis clear in our minds. Now, one of the things that I indicated at some point in our previous lessons is that, and you will notice it, the greatest attack that is being made on the words of Almighty God, the book that we call the Bible, the greatest attack is made on the book of Genesis. So that they have incorporated, brothers and sisters, into our school systems across the globe concepts that are foreign to the Bible. But they have done it in order to inculcate into our minds, into the psychology of our children from early that we evolved, that there was a theory way back then when there was a big bang and as a result of that there was a process called evolution from which man came and they have rooted that in a kind of scientific background so that those that are intelligent and most of us are those that are schooled and most of us are those that have taken their studies to tertiary levels, and many people have, they have somehow connected evolution to education. So that the point is, those that are behind the attack on the Bible, particularly the book of Genesis, have done it in such a way that if you are educated and if you want to move your educational acumen to a certain level, then you are bound to be one of those that critique the Bible and particularly the book of Genesis. It is coming across that if you are educated and if you are intelligent, it is impossible to accept the story as outlined in Genesis that God made man and woman they have somehow linked education and intelligence to the process of evolution so that those who would go out into our school systems feel belittled, feel unintelligent if they put forward their worldview that what we are seeing here was as a result of the word of God. The tendency is for you to feel small, you're in the minority, you feel belittled, and so you hold on to that. And many times, those that are in church circles who once knew God, once they become exposed to the university system, to the college systems, once they become exposed to certain affluent 
people in society, they are pressured to put aside what is considered archaic or storytelling episodes of how this world came into being. We are pressured to accept a lie that we have been he here billions of years ago and the earth was around from that time and animals and dinosaurs and a whole lot of things that is a part of our world system today has been around for billions and billions of years and through a process of evolution and natural selection we have things as they are today. The, the, the sun in its place and the planets rotating around the sun and everything in their respective orbits and they go at a certain speed. If it went a little too fast, we would have been burnt to death. If the earth were a little bit closer to the sun, we would have been, in, well, we would have melted and die by virtue of the heat or if we were a little too far from where we are presently located and if we we're a little bit too far from the sun you would understand brothers and sisters that we would have been cold and freeze to death so that we are at the right position from the sun here on earth that allows for life as we see the scientists will tell us that that all came about by chance and all the beauty and the sequencing and everything that operates and rotates and moves not just in this galaxy but in all the other galaxies one would want us to believe that it all happened by chance there was no intelligent mind there was no special design there was nothing that was according to a pattern it just happened by chance and men and women today who are intelligent accept that because they feel and would not want to accept the simplicity of what is written in the book of Genesis that God created the heavens and the earth. And so even amongst those in Christendom, there is a kind of skepticism when it comes on to the book of Genesis. We claim in many instances that we believe the things are there that are there are right and are correct and this is what the word of god says we claim that but in essence in reality many of us are weighing some things in the balance quietly secretly in our minds because we have not embraced the book of genesis as we ought to we took the time out, brothers and sisters, to give us that overview because it sets a certain tone and it allows us to put some things into sequence so that we can see that what we have today really could have emerged from a basic outline, a basic pattern of things as was outlined. And so when we did the overview and we looked at some of the themes of the scriptures and we see where in one instance there was the creation, then in another instance there was the fall, then in another instance there was the promise that redemption would come. And when we start to see that coming out of the book of Genesis and then go into other scriptures coming down the line, we, we are able to put it together. If we dare to put aside the validity, the reality of the book of Genesis, then I dare say we are putting aside everything else in the Bible because everything else that is there is hinged on what we believe and accept from the book of Genesis. Yes, it was important that I say that. I want us to be one track minded. I want us to understand and I want us to accept, brothers and sisters, that what is in the book of Genesis, it is real. It is factual. It is how things went. The challenge that many folks have and what has caused confusion in the minds of a lot of God's people 
is the fact that what we do, we, we look at the scientific explanations and then we try to use that to fit it into the Bible. Or we look at the scientific explanations and we try to take the accounts in Genesis and make it fit into the, the scientific mold. We cannot do that. We cannot try to fit the Bible in science. But if there is any fitting that is to take place in trying to convince someone that the book of Genesis is true and that the Bible itself is real, then what must happen is that we must take the Bible as the central focus and everything else must fit within what is outlined in the book. We don't try to make the Bible fit. If we do that, we are giving credibility to something else and the Bible becomes subordinate to that. But that must not happen. The Bible must have full credibility and everything else be subordinate to the word of Almighty God. Every scientific item must be subordinate to what is written and what is outlined throughout the entire book of Genesis, which is the subject area of our study. And so that is a fundamental approach. Don't try to make the Bible fit into science. If any fitting is to take place, fit science in the Bible. The Bible is yea and amen. It is the word of God. Genesis is the account of creation. Genesis is where the first glimpse of redemption has taken, has been shown. Genesis is where everything else is established to conform and to come back into conformity ultimately with God, what God's original plans and intentions were for this earth, for humankind, and for the relationship between God, the Almighty, and man. So I want to reaffirm, I want to make it clear to every saint of God that we start first with Genesis and what is written in that book. Now I know that there are many things that cause discomfort in the intellectual minds of believers. I know that there are some things because of our educational upbringing, we must question certain things and we must ask certain questions and that is quite fine. But in asking the questions and in putting your things together and in trying to reconcile some stuff that you think you know scientifically and otherwise and to reconcile it with the word of God, you've got to be open to what is written in the book because God stands supreme. Notice that God did not tell us where he came from. He didn't feel like he should tell us and he tells us what he thinks is good enough for us. If you want more, well, sorry, but God has already told us what he thinks we need to know. He tells us that in Genesis 1 and verse 1, in the beginning, God. He tells us how everything came about here. He tells us how it started. Of course, he makes us know who started it, but he chose not to tell us where he came from. And we can only work with that. Not even science can tell us. He chose not to reveal that in the future, in the by and by, maybe God will reveal that to us or how that whole God thing came into being. But of course, it occupies many of our minds. But let us not be worried about that. But I do know that there are folks that are concerned. They want to know where Cain got his wife. We're going to look at that. That's where we are going shortly. They want to know where did the, the, the nations come from. Why are they so diverse? Where did the races come from? If it was just one parent, everybody should look Chinese. Or if it was just one race, all of us should be black. Why is it that some are white? Why is it that some are black? Why is it that some are Chinese? Why is it that some are Indian? And a whole lot of questions arise. Are there answers there? 
there are answers. And it is important that we know that. But if we are going to, and I'm going to just quickly use this to springboard into some of the things that I want us to look at. If we are going to use the scriptures to show and to address some of these questions, topical issues, right questions. Where did the racist come from? Right question. Um, where did Cain get his wife? Because it was only Cain and Abel, and then Cain killed Abel, and then Seth came late. Seth came later down the line, so it was now Cain and Seth. Cain left and went to the land of Nod. Uh, how did he find a wife there? I mean, it's, it's just crazy. Something is wrong with Genesis, because this is what the skeptics and the scientists in some instances and the agnostics in other instances, this is what they use to tell us and that there is a big push to use these things to try and discredit the validity of the book. But the answers are right in front of our eyes and I want us to do that. They, they have come up to tell us that dinosaurs are the big challenge because the Bible never mentioned dinosaur. The Bible never mentioned these big creatures and yet they are, of, they are on earth. We have the fossils, we have the bones and based on carbon dating technologies and so forth, when we do the aging of these bones, they go back billions of years and yet you tell us that the Bible says from Adam to such and such was X generation and from this to such and such was X generation and from this amount to the time of Jesus was X generation so that you can put a time span on our existence here on earth and it is running approximately 6,000 years. If we are only here for 6,000 years, then it means that something is wrong because the dinosaurs were here millions and millions of years ago. How do you reconcile these scientific facts with the Bible? But I want us to know that the Bible has a lot to say, has a lot to say where these things are concerned. And they're not as hard as we think. Our minds are being bombarded with a lot of things. And the, those in the, uh, these scientific arena, that behind them, some of them don't even know that behind them there are forces pushing them to continue to feed these things about evolution and that there is no God and that we came from a certain place and look at the dinosaurs that means that Genesis is wrong because Genesis from its beginning till now is only a limited time the dinosaurs are millions of years hundreds of millions something is wrong with the Bible put it aside and be enlightened and follow but if you do that if we do that we are declaring that the word of God is not true and cannot be trusted and is not the source and that is what satan wants so brothers and sisters whether we like it or not we are going to have to take some time and we are going to have to go into the book of genesis and we are going to have to reinforce all that we have had before and strengthen ourselves and confirm and reaffirm in our own minds and psychology that the book of Genesis is real. It is God inspired. It outlined correctly all that God wanted us to know about creation and redemption. And it is important that we understand and grasp that. And so I've said this as a kind of refresher to all that we have done before so that we don't spend much time. I just want to quickly run through the theme so that we are again clear on the theme of Genesis, that it is a book of beginnings and it covers some things. So I'll just use about two or three slides just to f form the basis of a quick review in addition to what I've said before. And once that is done, now we springboard into looking and drilling into some of the very issues that has caused many to deny their faith in the word of God, to deny that the Bible could really be the authentic word of Almighty God. We are going to delve into some of these things and we are going to be clearing our minds. And I just want that to happen because that is really the essence of going through this book, you know, for us to understand where we are today. We are coming from a particular place and 
That history was real history. And I want that to be cemented in our minds. Our youngsters going to college and, and, and those tertiary institutions are being affected and we don't know it. But we want to be have this rooted and grounded in their minds so that no professor, no, no, no men that are being used by instruments of Satan to get to them can actually cause them to turn over. We are going to present the word and I pray that we encourage all our youngsters to get into Genesis, to understand Genesis, to talk about Genesis, and to make sure that it is indelibly imprinted in our conscious and subconscious minds that this is indeed the words of Almighty God. The book of Genesis is real. The book of Genesis is a true history. And it is important that we have that locked in our system. So let us do a quick review. And we did indicate, we did indicate that the, the, the theme um, of the book of Genesis uh, is one of beginnings. It speaks about the, in fact, the name itself of Genesis means beginning. It speaks about the beginning of everything, the beginning of this world and the world system as we know it, the beginning of, of family life, the beginning of man, the beginning of woman. The book of Genesis speaks about the beginning of nations. It speaks about the beginning of, of just about everything as we know things are. It had, they all had their Genesis in the book called Genesis, right? And it simply means beginning. It has 50 chapters and, as I just said, gives us a complete history of everything, right? Uh, the, and we're just adding some more here, the history of the world, the history of humanity, the history, uh, the beginning of sin, amen, the, the promise of redemption. This is where we first heard about redemption. Amen. Uh, the beginning of family life, the beginning of civilization, the beginning of the Hebrew race, the beginning of nations right across the world. This book is indeed a book that we must take time out and get into because it shows us, it literally shows us exactly where everything emanates from and that is very important for us to know. Now, one of the things that is important in studying any book, especially if it's a big book, if we can find a way to, to divide up big things into small segments, and then if there's any interrelation, we see how they are interrelated. If there are none, at least we can look at it segment by segment. And then when we are through, we get a full feel for everything that is contained in the big book. It's difficult to just bite a big um, piece from something. But if we can take on a massive undertaking and then attack that undertaking piece by piece, bit by bit, then we are in a position to cover the thing in a kind of systematic and understandable way. And that is what has happened in the book of Genesis, where we could easily divide it up into um, nine major decisions. When we look in the book, we see where in chapters 1 and 2, it speaks about creation. That's the first the, the, the vision. Then in chapter 3, it speaks about the fall of man. You know, Of course, we know that in creation, one of the things that uh, was created, one of the created beings, one of the things created was man, male and female created, he, them. But they were created and it all was good. But yet by chapter 3 we see where man fell. So chapter 3 speaks about the fall of man and we had the whole thing outlined there. By we get to chapter 4, it speaks about the first civilization and the interaction of men and groups of people who where tribal people, you know, expanding outwards and we see what was happening where civilization con was concerned. When we go through chapters 5 to 9, we see the old episode of the flood where even after God in chapters 1 and 2 made man and they started to multiply and, and of course 
after the fall and they started to multiply and then the civilizations, you know, it started to spread out. Things became so bad that by chapters 5 to 9, God had to pronounce judgment on man that he had made. The Bible said at one point when God, in reference to man, said every imagination of his heart was just evil continually. And so in chapters 5 to 9, we see where God pronounced judgment upon humankind and not just on humankind but on the animal kingdom and so forth and at the end of the day there was a total wipeout save and except for Noah and his family and those animals that were chosen two of each kind and more of some others but uh, uh, of animals that were chosen to go into the ark and God preserved those, Noah and his family, and those animals, preserved them in the ark for posterity and for replenishing and repopulating the earth later on. Uh, chapters 10 and 11 speaks now about the dispersion of nations because we now know that although it was just Noah and his family and he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, it was through these three sons and the family starting to expand that the nations know, the new set of people that were born to know. Because remember now, everybody outside of Noah and his family was wiped out. So it was going to be a new start, a new beginning. And Shem, Ham, and Japheth, who are the sons of Noah, they now took it up from there. And chapters 10 and 11 tells us how they having children and continuing, continuing, it started to be spread across, and this is how the nations were dispersed. So, uh, as we then move on from there, we go into chapters 12 to 25. Now, we shift from nationwide things, we shift from broad things, we shift from the, the, the creation, we shift from the fall, we shift from redemption, we shift from all the other things that were happening. And as we look through chapters 12 to 25, it is speaking essentially about one main figure, and this was Abraham. And then if we go on to chapters 17 to 35, it speaks about Isaac, another main figure. Then chapters 25 to 35 speaks about another main figure, which was Jacob. And then finally in chapters 30 to 50, it speaks about another main figure. This was Joseph. All these four men are a part of the Hebrew family that made up the Hebrew nation. So evidently, after God shows us everything before in the different breakdown, the division of the book, when it came to chapter 12, everything from chapter 12 to chapter 50 was about the Jewish nation, the Hebrew nation, uh, that ultimately became known as Israel. And clearly, God had a plan there because um, he devoted so much time between chapters 12 and 50, dealing while there were stories to be told and they were being told, the major figures were Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So we kind of went through and have a good feel and got a synopsis of what it is that was, was happening um, in the book of Genesis. And it is important that we understand uh, uh, you know, the, the, the breakdown, the layout, because we, we see things that are systematic, we see things that make sense, we see things that can be aligned with other scriptures and other things in scriptures, we see patterns emerging, and so we know that it is just not one big book with things haphazardly thrown all about the place, but there is a pattern. There is interconnection, and that speaks to inspiration. And the book is inspired because it is the word of Almighty God. And the things that are there are there for a reason. They serve a purpose, and let us not lose sight of that fundamental fact. All right, so that was just to give us a good overview and perspective of some of the things that we had gone through. Now, I want us to pick up by taking time out to, to see how God 
does his thing in a very organized, strategic, well patterned way. When we start to look, brothers and sisters, at how God outlines his thing in Genesis, we see foresight. A lot of things could not happen by chance as many people would want us to think. We see clearly foresight right from its beginning pages. We know that Genesis means beginnings. It is a book of beginnings and it speaks to all the things. We have gone through them already. But we also know that, and we have said it, in Genesis, not only are things relating to beginnings pointed out to us, but even the whole story of redemption was outlined to us right from the very beginning in one book, in a few chapters, an entire history was outlined. Folks don't know the power of Genesis, how deep it goes. I want us to take a journey as we look at a few things, brothers and sisters. I want us to take this journey to kind of uh, reinforce what we already have in our minds and to, to, to help to build so that we can stand properly and maintain our faith in the words of Almighty God. It is so very important. And it seems as if I'm taking the time to try to drill Genesis into our system. If it comes across that way, don't feel any way about that. I am trying to do that. I want us to, to understand that it is foundational and we must stand on it. It is at the core of everything that we believe. It is at the core because salvation that we now have that came by and through Jesus Christ, it came as a result of what happened in the book of Genesis. It is not, it is not something that just came up arbitrarily out of the blue. It was mentioned from the early parts of Genesis, where from Genesis chapter 3 and verse 50, God spoke about the seed of the woman, so that from a particular woman, a seed would come that was going to bring salvation, and in bringing that salvation, it was going to bruise the head of the serpent for that salvation to be brought. And we all know that that made reference to our great emancipator, the great Messiah, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is now that we know, looking back, but when that was being said, back, when that was being said back there and then, nobody knew exactly what it meant. But evidently, there had to be real inspiration to put that there from that time and then have it coming to pass thousands of years down into the future. The book is inspired and the book has its origins in the heart of Almighty God. I want every saint, I want every young person that is going off to university, I want every young person that is taking the time out to uh, you get themselves into the Word of God, to rivet this into our consciousness that the book of Genesis outlines real events that are given to us through the hands of Moses and coming from the heart of Almighty God. Now, I want us to take a small journey with me. Notice that I said that Genesis is clear, but just a cursory look at the book, if we just gloss over it, brothers and sisters, there are some things that easily we will miss. Like everything else, if we are going to be truly blessed, if we are going to find real gold, if we are going to find precious stones, brothers and sisters, we are going to have to dig deep and we are going to have to uh, sweat in our pursuit for these things. And similarly, where the word of God is concerned, there are some treasures that are dear, but to, to get to real treasures, we are going to have to dig deep and, you know, we are going to have to toil hard and we are going to have to give time 
to getting to where the treasures are even in the word of Almighty God. You've got to move at it with diligence and with all of our hearts. And it is one of the things that God said through his prophet, you know, the, you will find me. And this is how he works. But only when you have searched for me with all of your hearts. Now, we're going to look at something together as we explore Genesis to see that somehow there is a pattern. If, if we are saying that creation and redemption is practically amalgamated in the book of Genesis, then show it. Show me how you can, apart from that little scripture in Genesis 3.15, and apart from some things that you might look at later down in Genesis where Abraham took Isaac and took him onto the, the, the altar, and we know that it represents and it symbolizes Jesus Christ, who the Father loved, but yet offered on the altar of the cross to die for our sins. That was already, that was there in Genesis, and that by itself is good enough to convince any man that this book is inspired and it is authentic because that what Jesus did that which happened to him as a part of the process of redemption where he was sacrificed where he died on the altar called the cross and to do that would have bring about the redemption of others that was prefigured in what Abraham was doing to Isaac and we know that just looking at the connections just looking at the, the pattern and what we are seeing in the pattern that there was connection and so clearly there is inspiration in the book but I want to take it a bit further now for some folks they have never seen it like this but that's all right we all take time and we take we, we learn every day and we see new things, but they have never seen it like this. But, but come with me and let us look through some aspect of Genesis. We'll cross over into Exodus. We'll cross over into the New Testament to bring this story to light in terms of what I am saying. But I want us to take time and let us go through and see the interconnectivity. Let us see the nexus of creation with redemption some folks are of the impression that when adam and eve sinned by disobeying god it took god off guard even to some small extent and so god had to now change the game plan and to put a lot of things in place and to so these things were happening and as soon as satan did something god did something to counteract it and no 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 from the very beginning God knew what was going to happen so that from the day he put Adam and Eve in the garden, he already knew what was going to happen. So before he, and to show you that God knew what was going to happen before, to show us that God is sovereign and is not taken off guard. Listen to what the sovereign God is saying to us even from the first day of creation. What if I tell us that from the first day that God created something, he was telling us something about the process of redemption. Brothers and sisters, write in our Bible, from day one of creation, before Adam and Eve came here, God was saying some things about redemption to us. What, Bishop? What was he saying? I don't see anything. Read it again. Read it again. But from Genesis 1, verse 1 coming down, from the time that he started in creation and the first day of his creation, God said something to us about redemption. You want us to look at it and look deeply together? So let me bring up the slide and we are going to take our time and we are going to go through and see what it is that God might have been saying to us right from the very beginning. Now, 
even from the very beginning, the Bible tells us that God was doing some things in relation to creation, right? Day one to six, days one to six, God literally, literally created the heavens and the earth. And the seventh day, he didn't do anything. So we know that everything that happened, happened um, <clears throat> in days one to six. Now, I want us to take time out. And I want us to look together. In fact, I'm going to ask that we look at Genesis. Genesis chapter number one. I want us to read a couple of verses together. It is very important. Genesis chapter one. And let us start from verse one. So we're going to do a little reading. Don't watch the time. We will, we will always make up on the time. We have time at our disposal. Don't worry. But I want us all to grasp what I am going to present, and I want us to read it because I'm saying to us right from beginning, right from day one of creation, God was saying some things to us. And so I want us to read um, together. Genesis chapter 1, let us start from verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So brothers and sisters, no, nothing created here, you know, we're getting a little background from God as to how things were. Uh, but in verse 3 now, all of a sudden, look at what's happened now. God is now moving um, to start his creation, this process of creation, creating the things that we now see. And God starts in verse 3. And God said, let there be light. I hope we are watching and reading carefully together. Let there be light. And there was light. And in verse 4, God saw the light and God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. So we are seeing now that, you know, on the first day, God created light. And he separated light from darkness. So on the first day, God made light. So we're seeing that. Good. Very important. Now, as, let's just continue to read together. You know, watch closely. See if you see anything jumping at you, you know, scenes of God. Because I want us to understand that long before God made Adam and Eve, before they could get even the chance to sin, God was pushing something out to us that indicated redemption. I would love to see that, I'm sure you are saying. Let us read. So verse, where are we? Verse 5. Let us read verse 5 again. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Verse 6 now. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God all the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning was the second day and so we read on and God said let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear and it was so and God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called he sees. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, <clears throat> uh, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind and God saw that it was good verse 13 and the evening and the morning 
were the third day. Now, I don't know. I don't know if we notice a pattern as yet. But I hope we have. Notice, so far, three days, and in, after he created what he did each of the time, after every creation, I want us to notice something. I saw it in verse 5. We saw it in verse 8. And we just again looked at it in verse 13. Let us look at what it says each time. Let us look at what it says each time. In verse 5, it says at the end, And the evening and the morning was, were the first day. Notice that? And then by we read a little further, and he did some more in terms of creation, and we came down to verse 8. And God called the firmament heaven. And we see it again. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And then we read again and say, God did some more creation. And then by the time we get to verse 13, and this is after he caused the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And on this third day, he said it again. And the evening and the morning were the third day. Now, we could say, all right, you're making too much about this. Because, you know, so what? The evening and the morning were the third day. And you, you, what's, what is it? We're seeing a pattern that he starts his work in the evening. And he finishes it in the morning. What you know? Sometimes we go through the thing and we just read over it. But we do, because, brothers and sisters, we are used to talking about our day, that 24 hour day. And we start our work in the morning and we finish in the evening. And this is going way back. So that if we are going to talk about a day, even Jesus said one time, you know, we work while it is day. You know, 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. And we want to do work when it is daytime. We want to say. So for many of us, for all of us, if we are going to give this scripture a day and show how much work we do, for some of us we say we start from 6 a.m. Because we want to get so much done. And by 5, 6 o'clock in the evening I finish. You know how much I accomplished today. And then we go and we sleep in the night. Or we go and we rest in the night. But notice, right from the beginning, God said the evening and the morning. Not the morning and the evening. The evening and the morning was the first day. The evening and the morning was the second day. The evening and the morning was the third day. Brother Daly, what does that have to do with redemption? But let me not jump the gun. Let me read. Because I want us to go through this thing together. You know? I, want us, and I, I want us to read the chapters, the verses. Sorry. So verse 14. And God said, <clears throat> Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and it was so and God made two great lights the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening saints of God, 
and the morning were the fourth day. I, I'm going to read further, you know. But again, I want to make a simple point here. The central theme and person throughout the Bible we know is Jesus. Our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the central person in the Bible. The central theme from Genesis, because the fall came early in Genesis, and everything after that was dealing with redemption, purchasing back mankind to God, the process of coming out of sin and coming into living in the light, into the presence of Almighty God. The central theme of the Bible is redemption. After what we saw in Genesis with the creation and then the fall, centrally after that, everything was revolving around redemption. Right throughout the other books in the Bible, it was revolving around redemption. So it is important that we understand that point, that centrally a lot of things that we see, everything that we see happening going down the line was revolving around the redemptive process. Bear this in mind. So I want us to continue to slowly go through Revelation chapter 1 with me. So we're at about verse 14 now. So let us continue to read. I want us to go through and having just said what I said, what the central theme was, let us continue. But notice in verse 19, we said it again. The fourth time, the evening and the morning were the fourth. Then God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every wing fouled after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Um, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening... And the morning were the fifth day. There again, clear pattern, brothers and sisters. And then we're coming finally to... And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And it's go on and explain all the things that God was doing um, in this last part of his creation. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, uh, and in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And it was so. Of course, if we could jump back up to a little, to verse 27, just for context. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So with all the fowl of the air and the cattle over of the earth and the creeping things upon the earth and, and the tree that yielded fruits and everything that we are seeing in the fish and of the sea and every, all of this was done, all created. God looked at it and God said, I have 
given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything, verse 31, that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And again, brothers and sisters, we are seeing, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. It seems clear, it seems clear that God starts his work in the evening and completes it in the morning. And somewhere between evening and going all night, in the morning time, it was finished. So the evening and the morning, brothers and sisters, not the morning and the evening. So when we're talking about creation, we're talking about evening and morning. But didn't we say that creation and redemption goes hand in hand? I said it to us. It goes hand in hand. And if God in his creation went evening and morning, and then what he created in that period, starting in the evening and finishing in the morning, everything that he did, it was good. So that the story of creation and redemption, as I said before, are parallel to one another. Creation literally points us in terms of the creation story. It literally points us to redemption. Now, I'm going to show us now how in the process of redemption, what happened in creation in terms of the evening and the morning, it just comes to bear, comes to the fore right in the process of redemption every time. I want us to turn to the, turn to the, the next slide because I want us to look at firstly how God redeemed Israel out of the land of Egypt. And that was very, very, very important. Very, very important. Because we are going to see a pattern here that reflects what happened in creation in terms of the evening and the morning. And God starting his work in the evening and complete it in the morning, and whatever was happening happened right throughout the evening into the morning. But by morning time, it was good. The thing was made, and it was good. Creation happened, and it was good. And this was always declared after the evening, by morning time. So the evening and the morning, and the thing happened. Very important pattern to observe, very important point for us to focus on. So I want us brothers and sisters to take a quick look at how God redeemed Israel out of Egypt and the scripture is there for us and I want us to I want us to take time pardon me now as we read a few scriptures because I want to give a background and I want us to understand what actually happened and how it happened. Of course, you know, it came time now, saints of God, it came time where God was going to take his people out of their bondage in Egypt. So this is now redemption. Of course, we know that the, the coming out of Israel, out of Egypt, is a type of we as men coming out of bondage. Yes, Egypt was a type of bondage and a type of sin. And when Israel came out of Egypt, it's been referred to as them coming out of bondage, walking away. They are being redeemed from the bondage of Egypt. So I want us to read together, right? I'm giving us that for a background and some things that happened before they marched out of Egypt. Egypt, right? Some things that have happened. There's a process of redemption. There is a process that was there and it is important that we understand and that we grasp the concept and then see how God did 
his thing in terms of allowing the process of redemption in the same way that we saw the process of creation or he did what he did on day one but it was notice as i said the evening and the morning so that god started his work in the evening and he finished it in the morning and then the evening and the morning that was the first day and on the second day the same thing happened the evening and the morning and the second day so he started the work in the evening and whatever he did he finished it the morning and then the evening and the morning was the second day so i want us to read together to look now that was creation i want us to look at redemption but before we come to the real redemption story, which we all know happened in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, another type of redemption took place long before in the book of Exodus. So Exodus chapter 12 tells us now, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning so remember now you know Moses is talking to them the day before and this is the process of redemption and we see blood is going to be applied, don't we not? We are talking, brothers and sisters, about redemption. So Moses called them the evening and said, Look here, this is what I want you to go to know. Get your lamb, get your basin, put everything together. And here's what's going to happen. I don't want to jump ahead of the scriptures, but just to give us the back. Here's what's going to happen. The death angel is going to pass through tonight. But we have got to, in our process of preparation to depart tomorrow, we have got to do some things from this evening, and then the process going to continue throughout the night when the death angel passing through, and then by tomorrow, in the morning, we are going to leave. None of you must be out of your door of your house until in the morning. So here Moses is telling them what to do in the evening, you know, the day before, and saying, look, man, get your lamb, get your basin, get your hyssop, and this is what you're going to do. And he started to go through and to explain the whole thing to them. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he see the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. All right? And so, so we are clear. We are clear what is happening here now. So God is talking to them now, you know. God is talking to them and he's telling them, here's what you're going to do this evening. Every man go and get his lamb and every man go and have his basin and every man is going to have is hyssop and every man is going to take the blood from out of the basin and you're going to strike it over the two door posts and you're going to strike it over the lintel because tonight God is going to pass through and when he sees the blood he will pass over your house and nobody is going to be smitten once he is in the the house now read let us read now Exodus 13 verses 20, 20. and they took their journey from Sukkoth and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. I should, let me not read this as yet. Let me just hold this for a while. And let me just explain something to us now. So, here is what is actually, here is what is actually happening, brothers and sisters. And let me just quickly run through. They all followed the instruction of Moses. We all know that. They took their basins. And the head of each house took the hyssop and sprinkled the lintel and the doorposts with the blood. And every man went in and they were told what they were to do long in advance. And once you go inside that place that evening, you were not to come back out until morning. Because they are now in the process. God had now outlined to them how and what the process of redemption was. And notice 
we're talking now, not about creation, but about redemption. Notice that it was in the evening time that they were to do all of these things and go into their houses and lock themselves in. And somewhere between evening and night, whatever was going to happen to buy back those people and complete the redemption process, it was going to happen throughout the night, starting in the evening with the applying of the blood on the doorpost and the lintel right through the night. And they went into their houses and they were to stay there until when? Till in the morning, the evening and the morning. And this now, brothers and sisters, was in relation to redemption. But their process, their redemption process was not true yet. You know, when the morning came, listen to what happened. When the morning came, everybody took their things according to the word that they got from Moses, who got it from the Lord. When the morning came, man was to leave their house swiftly, because from in the evening before and everything, you know, they girded themselves and had their things ready, and they were going to move swiftly when morning came. And at morning time, every man grabbed the things that they had prepared and they left their houses and they left with everything that they were told to pick up and to leave with and Israel departed out of the land of Egypt in the morning but brothers and sisters as they went guess what happened when they reached a certain part of the journey the Egyptians recognize, my God, what have we done? We have let the people go. We are going after them. We're going to bring them back into bondage. And so the armies of Egypt went after them. But notice, they, they traveled and they traveled and they traveled until they reached to the Red Sea. Couldn't go no more. God still talking to us about redemption. And they reached the Red Sea. No, because God didn't want the Egyptians to catch up with them. God who was leading them earlier by way of a pillar of cloud. Removed from the front of the camp and came to the rear of the camp. And stood between the people of Israel and the people of Egypt. And to the people of Israel, he was a burning fire, giving light, and they were able to go through the night and keep moving. And to the other side, which was Egypt, it was like blackness and they had to rest so that they could not catch up with the Egyptians. They were always going and they were always lagging behind. This is the power of God. However, they are going to complete their redemption process now. Because remember, Egypt is coming to catch them, to carry them back. They are going to go away from Egypt altogether. But there was no a problem. Israel now met up on the Red Sea and didn't know what to do. And the armies of Israel, of Egypt, sorry, would have now been gaining momentum coming to them. But let us read Exodus chapter 13 and verses 20 to 22 and see what is happening here. Let us read and see what is happening here. Now, Exodus 13. And they took their journey from Sukkoth and encamped in Etham, in the edge of the wilderness. Verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. Verse 22. He took not away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night. And it is very, very, very important that we recognize that. I just mentioned that. Now, Exodus 14, Exodus 14 tells us and gives us something very, very important. Very, very important for us to, to, to ponder. So we see, we just saw where God took them out of the land of Egypt and carried them and 
allow them to go on their merry way. And he started that work in the evening when they kill Passover lamb and they put it on the doorpost. And that work continued throughout the night when the death angel was passing through. And they were to remain in their house until morning. And when morning came, they left. Redemption. Now, Exodus chapter 14 gives us a synopsis of what transpired when they went and could go no further. Now their process of redemption was going to be completed. But guess what? They were stopped from going forward because of the Red Sea, Exodus 14. So the Bible tells us that they could not go anymore. And I, I want to quickly turn to Exodus 14. I'm going to pick out a few verses for us. So let's bring it up because here's what happened. When they reached, and I want us to read it for us, ourselves, when they reached to that Red Sea and could go no further, God looked at Moses and said to him, Moses, what is it that you have in your hand? Let's find that verse because I'm going to read from there and then I'm going to kind of give us a little. What is it that you have in your hand? The Lord speak unto Moses and this is Exodus chapter number one and we are at verse one and the Lord speak unto Moses, you know, verse one. We're going to go to verse two and the Lord, let's, let's read a few verses here in Exodus 14 because I just like what we did before I really want us to get the gist of it what is it that you have in your hand speak to the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before Philorios between Migdal and the sea over against Baal Zephon before it shall ye encamp by the sea follow what is happening for Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel they are entangled in the land and the wilderness have shut them in and I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord and they did so and so verse 5 we continue and it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? I had mentioned that to us earlier on. That we have let Israel go from serving us. And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Follow what is happening now. Follow what is happening. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt. And captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. No, but the Egyptians pursued after them. All the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army uh, and overtook them encamping by the sea beside Philhar Harioth. Before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? And they were complaining, and is not this the word? And they carried on. And they, they, they murmured and they spoke. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Salvation, redemption is coming, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. And so Moses spoke, And the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And that was a serious word. And the Lord said unto Moses. And the Lord said unto Moses. 
Wherefore Christ thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod. Lift thou up thy rod. And stretch out thine hand over the sea. And divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Read on. We're coming. Read on. Verse 17. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all his hosts, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel removed and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came to pass, and it came between the camp of the Egyptians, which I outlined earlier, and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these as to the Israelites, so that the one came not near to the other all night. Verse 21, and Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. Watch it now. And the Lord, so all of this was happening in the all evening now, you know, because it's coming back to the, it's coming near night now, you know. So hear what is happening now. Look at verse 21. So Moses now stretched out his hand over the sea. And then, so all that I was telling, mentioning to you just now, coming up to this point, we were down at evening time. And here now, God said to Moses, what do you have in your hand? And he said, boy, he knows this is his rod. And he was told to stretch out the rod. And Moses stretched out his rod over the sea. So this is now night time now, no. so from evening all this happening, and it reached the point now where God was going to move, and God says, stretch out. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, of course, with the rod. And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong each wind. Brothers and sisters, look what is happening here now, you know. Going into the night, some things were happening. And here now, the completion of their redemption process where they are going to march through the Red Sea to complete their total departure from Egypt into the new land that God was going to give them. They were now going, they were now at the cusp of going into that, of completing that journey. And God told Moses earlier, which certainly would have been evening because this is now happening in the night time, reaching night now. And God, Moses in answering and in obeying the instructions of the Lord, he stretched forth his hands and stretched out that rod. And God, the Lord, caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry. And the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the gro dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them. The waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left hand. So, brothers and sisters, we see that all evening they were talking, they were dialoguing. And then God told Moses what he was to do, and Moses did it in the night. And from that point on, all night, because you're talking at this point, it was estimated by many that you had a, about a million, over a million in that region, Egyptians, so that, Israeli, sorry, in terms of God's people who were in Egypt, you had some what over a million people and they went through on dry ground through the Red Sea all night all night until they reached the other side but listen to what happened now so right from evening time 
verse 23. Right from evening time, <clears throat> they were going through until Moses lifted up his hand and the, the, the east wind came and separated the, the waters and all night that continued and Israel went through all night. That's what verse 22 said. Now verse 23, we pick up. And the Egyptians pursued and went in, that's into the sea, after them to the midst of the sea. Even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Brothers and sisters, look at what is happening, you know. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, so we see it happening here now. We're talking about redemption. This is the final phase of the redemption. It started from the evening before. Went all night. And now in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. We're going to read right down to verse 30. And took off their chariot wheels that they drove them heavily so that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fighted for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand over against the sea that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his rod over against the sea and the sea returned to his strength and they fled against it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariot and the horsemen and all the hosts of fear that came in the midst of the sea after them. And they remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptian. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore brothers and sisters it is right before our eyes and i'm going to use i'm going to use the opportunity just to let us know that this simple illustration is very 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 significant what started in the evening was completed in the morning in both instances. It is very important that we catch and that we understand that. When they were going to, the whole process of, of redemption was outlined to them through Moses. They were told in the evening to kill the animal to apply the blood and to stay inside all night until morning. And in the morning time, the process was completed and Israel was redeemed and came out of Israel. It started in the evening, it finished in the morning. I really wanted, I really allowed us to read the entire scriptures because reading it by itself, you wouldn't pick this out. But looking in Genesis and seeing that all of God's creation, evening and morning, and that was about creation. And it happened day one, happened day two, right down to day six, evening and morning. And during that evening when it started, and morning when it finished, during that time, creation happened. And since we said creation and redemption was right there at the beginning, God knew even before man came, because man came down, round about day five or day six we know when man came and they were there and yet from day one god said evening and morning yet when he's now referring to redemption he now says moses this is what's going to happen the folks are going to go down they are going to get their animal they are going to get their basins they are going to get their isop they are going to go apply the blood in the evening time they are going to go inside to stay in because during the night that angel is going to come and no man is to come out before morning the evening and the morning and this is now applied to redemption and remember now in the morning when moses said 
No man should come out before morning time. When the time came and they were to come out, they all left and they left with the treasuries of Egypt and they were now out of Egypt once and for all. Redemption came. Evening, then morning. And everything happened throughout that period, throughout the night. Then now we come to, because throughout the night is when the death angel was moving. So all of that redemptive process was happening all night. And then the morning came and the process was finished and they departed the land of Egypt. But the whole process was not complete because they then met upon the Red Sea. But having met upon the Red Sea, God was now showing us something because he was going to take them across and deliver them and complete the process that was started before. So in the evening, God started to talk to Moses and say, here's what you're going to do and this is what's going to happen. And that night, God caused a strong east wind to hold back the waters. And the Israelites went through on dry ground and the east wind blew all night. To allow them to go across. So it was evening throughout the night. And all the process of redemption was taking place. Evening. And then the morning was to come. What was supposed to happen in the morning? And verse 13 tells us. That in the morning. This is now after Israel went through. In the morning. God caused the chariot wheels. At, to start falling off. The chariots of Egypt. And when they realized that something was wrong, they decided to turn back. In the morning time, God just caused this east wind to stop and the, stop and the waters came back together. And they drowned. And in the morning, Egypt was behind them. And Israel was on the other side. The evening and the morning. And their redemption was complete. God used Genesis in telling us about evening and morning to let us understand that right here I'm dealing with creation, but I'm also dealing with redemption because redemption is going to take place in a similar manner, evening and then the morning. But let us tie it up now. I want us to tie up this and jump over into the New Testament with me as we look upon the ultimate sacrifice that was to be made to bring about complete redemption for all humanity for all times and this happened in the death and resurrection of our lord and savior jesus christ the same redemption and it was mentioned in genesis and here is what happened and i'm going to ask us to turn to you know saint Matthew chapter 26. So let's bring it up on the screen. We probably might not read everything this time, but um, I just want us to bring it up and I probably talk about it a little bit and jump to two other scriptures. And then from there, we, we um, wrap it all up. But it is important, brothers and sisters, it is important that we, that we recognize, it is important that we understand it is important that we grasp the, the, the simplicity of the thing and yet look to see that it was in fact there. It was in fact there that we want to... This slide. It was in fact there... <coughs> sorry. It was in fact there that we want to, you know, have our minds tuned in. We need to understand that as simple as it was, as we look into the scripture, as we dig deep into into the scripture we are going to see that these things jump out at us now we're that final process in terms of salvation or redemption is concerned where that process is it is important that we recognize that the story of Jesus and redemption and as we go on, we will see the evening and morning coming again. And it literally parallels what happened in Genesis, where the evening and the morning um, was very significant. 
March 26, uh, we, we know the story very well, and we know what transpired. Uh, you know, they had just finished supper, and, and it was important that we, we understand that having finished supper, it, it was now evening time, so that all of what was happening as it relates to redemption, it started, yes, in the evening, with the Passover lamb over there in Exodus that we spoke about a while ago, and it concluded, it was completed in the morning. It is the very same thing that is happening right here in the book of St. Matthew also, right? They had just finished, they had just finished the supper, and they had now gone out into the garden in Gethsemane in the evening to pray. And yes, indeed, they had, they had, you know, after a while, they, they went and they prayed and the, the disciples fell asleep. But notice a couple of things happening you know, this very evening, in between this evening time, a whole lot of things were happening. They took Jesus at one point, they convicted him, they, 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 they tried him, they convicted him, he was beaten. A whole heap of things was happening, a whole lot of things was happening. This was a long, long evening. But the process began in the evening time in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it is important that we understand that in every instance, you know, what, with what we spoke about earlier, it started in the evening and it was completed in the morning. Uh, creation started in the evening and it was completed in the morning. Redemption, we looked up at it in Exodus, starting with Passover when that was implemented. It started in the evening and it was completed in the morning. Their final departure out of Egypt and the wilderness to go over into the new land that God had given them. They had to go through the Red Sea. It started in the evening and it was completed in the morning, at morning time. And now we are coming over into the New Testament and we see in St. Matthew 26, I won't read it, but we can read it. Um, now when evening was come, he sat down with the twelve. So it's th this is where everything started because it is at this meeting that one of them was it was identified was going to betray him which he ultimately did and after dinner when he went out and everything they came and they held on to him and so the process started that evening and a whole lot of things happened and culminated um the following day when jesus now was taken down and was crucified and we know the story well brothers and sisters he was taken and without going into all of what happened and the stripes were applied to him and he was really given the, the full extent in terms of what was to, what was to happen. He was, he, he was taken through and he was taken and he was put to sun, you know, using our local terms. But he suffered and he went to that cross um, the following the following day and a whole series of things happened culminating with Jesus again now with Jesus at this time being placed on the cross Jesus at this time now being his finger his hands the nails went through he was hammered on that cross his feet was put together and the nails went in and he was hammered on that cross and he stayed there until he died and then he was taken down and he was put in the grave. So the process in terms of salvation that was to come started from before in the evening time when it was supper and from there the whole series of events, a whole series of events took place um, resulting in his death and then his burial. So it started in the evening and he was placed in the earth, died and was buried. He was locked away and he went through. But something happened. And it happened, brothers and sisters, in the morning. Yes, we know that some time had elapsed because another day had come in between and so forth. But that, we're not looking at the time now. We are looking at the pattern. And I want us to understand the pattern is that in creation, evening then the morning and in that span of time creation took place in redemption the evening and morning and whatever the time span was that the thing happened 
The pattern is it started in the evening and it was completed in the morning. And in the intervening time, the process took place. So creation, evening and the morning was the first day. Light came. Down and down and down and down, right to the sixth day. Six times the evening and the morning. And in between, the creative process. Similarly, brothers and sisters, redemption, it took place. Where Passover, when it was implemented, evening and the morning. The redemptive process took place. With Israel, when they were to go over the Red Sea and continue on into the Promised Land, evening it started, and at morning time, God caused the sea to come together again. The evening and the morning, and the redemptive process continued. And now with Jesus, in the evening time, after supper, because at even they went for supper, and then after supper they went to pray, and that is the night afterwards when a whole lot of things happened, and they came and they grabbed onto him, and they carried him, and they tried him, and he threw the night, a whole heap of things were, were happening, until the following day when the final word was given, and Pilate said, boy, let him go, and they said, no, 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 until the final verdict came that he had to die and then they sent him off and by three o'clock that afternoon the sacrifice because that was the time of the evening sacrifice and at 3 p.m jesus was crucified and just about that time he died because it was at that time when it was the evening sacrifice time that the temple in the temple the curtain that separated the holy from the holy of holies was split in two from top to bottom, right? And it signaled that Messiah had died. The lamb was killed. The sacrifice was made. Redemption is complete. The process is now going to be going because they took him that evening and they put him in the grave before the sun went down and he went on. But the Bible said, this is the redemptive process now. So it started the evening at supper and after supper it started and it went through a period of time and the bible said in saint mark and i want us to turn to saint mark chapter 16 and verse 2 because the bible was very clear when it said that and, and also we're going to look at saint matthew 28 as we wrap up now just realize that the time is upon us and i will stop here but when we look at it in mark 16 and verse 2 and let us read it together and very early in the morning the first day of the week so it just comes up every time evening and morning in creation evening and morning at passover which marked the process of redemption evening and morning when they came to the red sea and they were supposed to be delivered totally from out of the and the hand of egypt and in the morning time god causes wind to stop and boom, it came together. And so it was evening, then morning, for the process of redemption, both at Passover time, both at the Red Sea time. And now here we are seeing it again with redemption, the final work of redemption by our Lord Jesus Christ himself in the evening time at supper. And then after supper is when he was betrayed and they took him and he was grilled that night going over into the following day and then they took him and they hung him on the cross and then he died and he was in that grave but very early in the morning the first day of the week they came onto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun and brethren they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? We won't need to read anymore. The, the, the point is, brothers and sisters, is resurrection took place in the morning. Throughout, throughout the entire episode, it was night time. But it started in the evening and it was completed in the morning. And this is the story of creation and redemption being twinned, be, de, being inextricably linked because we see the connection. We see the connection easily with how the entire process was done, right? Where creation was concerned, it followed a pattern, evening, then morning. Where 
redemption is concerned, it followed the same pattern that was there in Genesis. Evening, then morning. And so God had the evening and morning thing all set out in everything that had to do with creation and in everything that had to do with redemption. They go together. God had redemption in his mind right from the first day of his creation. It means that he knew what was going to happen and he made provision and preparation for it long before man came. So before Adam even got the chance to sin, God knew that he was going to sin. And God made preparation for the sin. And God planned how he ultimate, was ultimately going to reconcile man unto himself. And so the day is coming and we see it in Revelation where that reconciliation is going to be complete, where the entire system is going to be changed over. And what God intended in Genesis is going to be accomplished in Revelation. And so from the beginning, it was seen what was coming to come. So Genesis, origins, beginnings, it was the beginning of creation but also it was the beginning of redemption. And I want us to understand that although the events spanned thousands of years, that only show us, brothers and sisters, that it had to be an intelligent mind. It had to be an inspired mind that put this thing together to make it happen in this particular way. So we're going to stop with this for this evening because what we are going to do now, we are going to pick up to show that the things that folks use to discredit the book of Genesis, we are going to look at them and show you right from Bible how Genesis easily accommodates all of these things. But we are not going to start with science and fit it in the Bible. We are going to start with Bible and fit science into it. And we are going to go into the dinosaurs and show you that Bible speak about these great behemoths and these great land and sea animals. The Bible spoke about them. So when scientists tell us that the Bible cannot be right because these things were here long before man came, why didn't the Bible speak to them? That means the Bible is not a complete book. Oh, wrong they are. The Bible is complete. And the Bible spoke about them. And we are going to talk about that when we get back. We are going to show you that all the nations of the earth, as we see now, came from one family. And it is declared in the Bible, in the book of Acts. It is declared in the Bible, in Genesis. It is declared in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 5. It is declared. And we are going to show us that it is there. And show, and we are going to go into, gear up for when we meet again. Because we are going to take some time. And we are going to a, a, a little study on basic genetics. Basic DNA. So... We go understand that from Genesis, what we are learning about in DNA and you know, genetics was always there. And we are going to do some basic DNA analysis and some basic genetics. You remember when we go to school on the biology, for those who do it, you have the big X and the little X, and the big A and the little A, uh, which one was the dominant gene, and which one was the, the docile gene. We are going to take a little look at it, and we are going to show you that there is no such thing as different races, one race, Adam's race, the human race. And we are going to show you that this is in fact so, and we are going to show you where the different groupings come from and how they look the way we look, and why one skin is dark and one skin is light brown and one skin is dark brown, and why one skin is white and what we call white is not white. If you know what white is, I can show you what white is, right? This is white, and no man don't have this color. Who we call white man is not white. And I can show you that what you call black, black man is not black. I will show you variation of brown. Light brown, very light brown, dark brown, very light dark brown. And we just create things in terms of our vocabulary to describe particular things. But we are going to show, because the Bible declares it, and in Acts 15, for one blood, God created all nations. And we are going to show us that in the Bible, it is so. And so for those who believe that because we, our skins are black, it is black because we are cursed, because God cursed, we're going to visit that. It's right in Genesis. And it's not what many of us think. And we feel that the African race 
is cursed and the curse made us black, change that. That is not so. The Bible didn't say that. And incidentally, God did not curse Ham. God cursed Canaan, who was Ham's grandson. And why? We're going to get into that. So a whole lot of things. And the other thing where folks say the Bible cannot be right because Cain eventually married and he went down to Nod to, to get his wife. Where did his wife come from? In Nod. If it was only Cain and Abel and Seth. Well, brothers and sisters, it's not only Cain and Abel who died and Seth. But in between that, Adam and Eve never just look at each other and they were full of vim, vigor, and vivacity. They were busy. Busier than a whole heap of you youngsters who, they were busy. And they had children according to Genesis chapter 5 and verse 4. The Bible said they had more sons and daughters, whole heap. But we don't take the time out to look at Genesis to see what is really happening. And the Bible didn't say that he went to Nod to get a wife. The Bible said he knew his wife in Nod. When the Bible said you knew your wife, it don't mean you find her. It means you have sexual intercourse with her. Because after that he said and they have children. Abraham knew Sarah and that. So when the Bible said he knew his wife, that's not that he said he found his wife. He didn't say that. He didn't find his wife at Nod. He knew his wife at Nod. He had intercourse with his wife at Nod. And they had children. Oh gosh. So we're going to go into these things. And the things that people use to discombobulate our minds and make us think that the Bible is wrong. Oh, it is not wrong. And the things are simple and they are clear. So the key, firstly, as I said at the start, let's get a feel for the book and understand that the book follows pattern and is, it, it, it's not difficult to understand when we break it down into sections, into divisions. And once we get that, then we start to drill into different areas. And I started with this just to show, as simple as it might look, Simple things have deep meanings even in the book of Genesis. And so the evening and the morning happened the first day and things were created. The evening and the morning and redemption was wrought. Creation, redemption. One thing bring them together. They all happen evening and morning. I want us to understand that this is Genesis. Welcome to a whole lot of new information and understanding how God works. And his word is never wrong. The Lord bless you this evening. I stop here now and we pick up next week, God's willing. Amen. And um, we continue in the book of Genesis. So a few way, uh, things yet to go through, a little way to go. But I want us to get the feel and to see some things, to put them into perspective, to build our faith and then go out strengthened in the Lord. God richly bless you. Just before I pray, so that I just want to leave a quick announcement. And it's coming from the ladies' department, um, the ladies' fellowship that comes Monday, May 23rd, which is Labor Day. There is a trip uh, organized by the ladies' fellowship, and they are going to Sunrise Retreat over there in St. Mary. Uh, there is a cost to it. Um, adults, 3,500, children uh, under 12, 2,000, so maybe once you're over 12, you're going to be considered adult, but children under 12, 2,000, adults, 3,500, and this cost really covers the transportation and entry fee, all right? So that's, bear that in mind, is very important. Well, uh, you are being asked, once you're going to come, you know, take your snacks and your lunches because the, what, is, what, what, what is costing you is really to cover transportation. We want you to go and be comfortable in your, with your ride going up and it also covers your entry fee. And so you are required to take along your, your snacks and your lunch with you. Um, you're asked to get in touch to confirm your attendance, and we are asking all our ladies. We know it's a little time where you're gonna, we're getting at that little time now. There's a breather, you know, from the corona over the last two years. Not corona, sorry, but the COVID-19 over, which is yes, corona over the last two years, 
And so you utilize the time because we're not sure what is happening. We hear that the positivity rate is constantly going up. And if it continues to go up, we're not sure if we're going to go back into lockdown again. And so whatever we can do now, let's just do it and take some uh, fresh air and breathe uh, again. So please get in touch with Sister Ian Crooks or Sister Ivan Rowe um, to confirm your attendance. And we encourage, you know, as many of our ladies, our youngsters, that can make it a beautiful place and it's, it will be good to go and just to, you know, have a time of relaxation. Um, this Sunday, you are asked to conf make your final confirmation and also to bring in payments or to make arrangements to complete your payments, but you have up until this Sunday. So it is important, ladies, that you bear this in mind and do what you have to do very quickly. The Lord bless you. Let us pray. Father, we bless your great name. We thank you, mighty God. You have been absolutely good. You have been absolutely awesome in our lives. I pray, Father in heaven, that you will open our hearts to receive the words that we are teaching in this small series. I pray that you will help us to look a little deeper, to spend some more time in your word so that we can extract some of the gems that are there for us. Lord, help us to take the time to spend in your words. Help us to take the time to draw closer to you through your words. Touch our lives, I pray. I pray for our men. I pray for our ladies. I pray for our young people. I pray for our elders. I pray that you will bind your people together tonight with cords of love that cannot be broken. Lead and guide and direct us, we pray. Help us to love, love your words more than ever before. We give you thanks. We give you glory. We praise your great name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. And thanks again. And God's willing, next week, same time, in the name of the Lord Jesus. God bless you.